Welcome to IWRA's online conference, One Water, One Health. My name is Renee martin and it is my honor and pleasure to be your host for the opening ceremony of this outstanding contribution to the understanding and appreciation of the fundamental links between water and health. This online conference is being hosted by the International Water Resources Association and has been supported by two UN agencies, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO, and the UN Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, UNESCO IHP, whose general, generous financial contribution allows us to provide free access to the conference. Other partners and collaborators for the conference include the American University of Beirut, the Canadian Water Resources Association, and Texas A&M University. We also want to remind you that you all can see an excellent selection of submitted conference posters online at www.iwraonlineconference.org under the posters menu. If you have any questions regarding these posters, you can send an email to online.conference at iwra.org and we will contact the poster authors to respond to your inquiries. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Gabriel Eckstein, who is president of IWRA, professor of law at Texas A&M University, and uh, director of the law school's program in natural resource systems. Gabriel? Thank you so much, Renee. Um, it is really my pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the International Water Resources Association uh, to this online conference on One Water, One Health, Water Food, and Public Health in a Changing World. This event follows a very successful conference held last year in October 2020 on addressing groundwater resilience under climate change. 2021 is a very special year for IWRA as we celebrate the association's 50th anniversary Founded on November 29, 1971 in the United States, IWRA has become the leading global platform and community of researchers, educators, policy influencers, and managers who address local to global water-related challenges and improving water outcomes for all. Thus, this event marks an historic occasion for the association in a year that is filled with programs, activities, and with some surprises. For this online conference, more than 1,300 people have registered from all regions of the world, including Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas, both from developing and developed countries. While we are delighted to see so many friends and colleagues from around the world, we are especially delighted and happy to see numerous new faces from the international water community, and in particular, a more diverse audience that includes a broad array of women, the youth, and local communities. As we begin today's program, I want to thank the wonderful efforts and commitments uh, that we have uh, received from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, the UNESCO Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, for uh, both of these for co-organizing uh, co this major international water event with IWRA. And I want to thank the American University of Beirut, the China Water Resources Association, and Texas A&M University for their support and contributions to this conference. In addition, I want to highlight and express our great thanks uh, to the co-chairs of this online event, uh, Sasha, uh, Sasha Fuoshima, Robbie Motar, and Yuan Yan Li for the tremendous work that they have put into making this event come to fruition. Further, I want to thank the members of the International Scientific Committee and all of the moderators for all of the sessions uh, that, uh, that they will be uh, participating in and uh, all the countless hours that they have prepared uh, on this program and that you will enjoy over these next few days. And I want to especially thank IWRA's treasurer, Renee martin Nagel, and IWRA's project officer, Mary Trudeau, for moderating the opening ceremony today, as well as the closing ceremony on this coming Wednesday. Before concluding, I want to encourage you all to discover more about what this association does and what it represents and how we engage uh, with the different water sectors from around the world please look to uh, our website at iwra.org uh, and find, about, find out about all of the many activities that we have planned for this year in our 50th anniversary and further into the future. 
You can visit us at our website. And if you are not a member yet, please do consider joining our water family. I wish everybody a very productive and fruitful event as we commence the online conference on One Water, One Health, Water, Food, and Public Health in a Changing World. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. And now for our next speaker, I would like to introduce Daniel Gustafson, former Deputy Director General and Special Advisor to the Director General of FAO. Daniel. Thank you, uh, Renee. It's a real pleasure uh, for me to, uh, to speak on behalf of FAO. And FAO really is uh, delighted to be a partner organization and, uh, and take part in this um, uh, extremely important global event. The One Health concept, of course, is by now widely recognized that human health, animal health, environmental health are all intimately related. We know that a transdisciplinary approach is needed to understand and address issues of food, water, public health in a truly integrated way, both from a science perspective and also from a public policy perspective that is so uh, well represented in the, in the uh, agenda of the conference. Uh, like most of you uh, here today, FAO has been working on uh, uh, One Health for some time. And the approach, uh, interestingly, I think has continued to expand. Uh, much of FAO's work, of course, uh, continues to focus on zoonotic disease and capacity development. But the uh, One Health approach has also facilitated our understanding, for example, of how uh, improved water management by smallholder farmers leads in fact to greater diversity in what they produce. And that diversity, uh, interestingly, uh, independent of other factors leads to improved nutrition and health outcomes. Um, there's always a lot to learn on this and we uh, look forward really to the new insights coming out of the, of the online conference. Um, as we all know, global awareness this past year of, of what we might think of as One Health uh, themes has gone way up uh, due most obviously to uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, it, it certainly has been a changing world and there's been a lot more attention on public health and on the widespread disruption uh, in food supply chains that were a consequence of uh, response to the pandemic. It's made us all uh, much more aware really of the fragility of the food system and public health and how interconnected they are. Uh, furthermore, in some countries, the uh, previous experience of applying One Health uh, approaches or principles in capacity development for surveillance and monitoring, prevention and control uh, were a critical factor in uh, devising their own COVID-19 responses. Uh, as an additional background element to the conference, uh, as many as of you know, the uh, UN Secretary General has called uh, for a, a food system summit coming up in uh, September at the margins of the UN um, General Assembly. Uh, project, progress on achieving the sustainable development goals has been far too slow and uh, leading to this decade, the so-called decade of action to accelerate change on the, uh, and progress towards those goals. And the Secretary General um, chose food systems as part of an all UN effort, not just those of the food related agencies. Uh, food systems is the focus of the summit to help get things moving. And because we're all consumers of food and a huge portion of the a global workforce and the global economy is linked to food in one way or another. Uh, food systems may in fact be a more manageable or a more, let's say, imaginable way of thinking what progress, thinking through what progress towards sustainability uh, would look like. And by looking at these interrelated issues of food systems, it could give us a, a helpful way to work through how we collectively uh, can move to a more sustainable uh, pathway. Uh, the work streams leading up to the summit and the discussions going on uh, at multiple levels uh, around the world are all well along by now. And it will be a surprise to none of you that water related issues feature very prominently in uh, all of them. 
water resources are related, as we know, to food, health, the environment, climate change, resilience, employment, women's empowerment, um, employment for youth, indigenous knowledge, all the elements that determine the sustainability of food systems and those uh, same elements impact directly on achieving the SDGs. Uh, within all of that, it's, as I say, no surprise to, to any of us that water features so prominently as water underpins our livelihoods, our health, our environment, our economies. Water access is a fundamental condition of human survival and dignity. It's the basis of resilience for societies and vital for human nutrition and health. It's essential for ecosystem management, agriculture, energy, and ultimately overall planetary health. Water scarcity, poor water quality, inadequate sanitation affect food security, nutrition, health, economic opportunities, all of which are key challenges of the 21st century. Uh, with that as a backdrop, I'm just certain that the discussions on water, food, public health in a changing world will contribute greatly in advancing our understanding and making progress on, on all of these challenges. So thank you very much for your attention and I wish you all a very successful conference. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, now we're going to hear from the three co-chairs of the International Scientific Committee for this conference. First, we will hear from Sasha Kuoshima, who is Deputy Director and Head of Water at FAO. Sasha? Thank you, Renee. And a big welcome to all of you to this year's IWA online conference. Um, exciting for me to be here and, and to be with so many distinguished uh, speakers and participants uh, for this conference. And it, it also provides me a unique opportunity to thank the people working across the spectrum of water, agriculture, food, health, finance, academia, development, and, and many others who will come together for these three days. Um, it is pivotal. This conference also exemplifies the dialogue and engagement um, that the world community has committed itself to examining the linkages between water, food, and health. And I wanted to mention some, uh, some about the FAO strategy and it's been calling on all of us in these various different transdisciplinary sectors to come together with our member countries and partners, many are here at the conference, to work closely together towards a path that leads us to a better tomorrow through better production, better nutrition, and better environment for a better life. This is FAO's um, mission statement. To transform also our food systems, as um, Dan has mentioned earlier, that encompass the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, addressing climate change, biodiversity, natural resources management, and healthier diets uh, where water is a transversal element. I'll mention a little bit about water and then about food security and nutrition. On the subject of water, the world population is expected to grow to more than 9 billion people by 2050. And FAO estimates that 50% of food will be needed, whereby agriculture is responsible for 70% of the fresh water withdrawals worldwide. Additionally, the amount of available freshwater resources per person has declined for more than 20% in the past two decades. So currently 1.2 billion people or a fifth of the world's population live in areas of water scarcity. Achieving food security while using water resources in a sustainable manner is a major challenge for current and future generations. And we at FAO are at our division, Land and Water Division are, are facing um, are working a lot on this area to decrease the pressures uh, on water scarcity. Resolving issues around water scarcity, pollution and wastage, wastage is also crucial in transforming our food production and consumption. Yet, even though water is prominent, um, but water on the food systems elements is taken for granted many times. So it's important that water management accommodates the shifting needs and the resource constraints, as well as the health imperatives, such as food security and nutrition. Water is key to achieving food security. The crops and livestock need water uh, to grow. In 2020, estimated 
768 million people, or that is close to about 10% of the global population, suffered from chronic hunger. That's an increase of 118 million people compared to the year before. So this is a number, unfortunately, that increased due to the COVID-19 pandemic and its economic impacts were felt worldwide. These trends provide hard evidence on the high proportion of population facing serious constraints on their ability to obtain safe, nutritious, and sufficient food. And today, nutrition challenges are much greater than in the past. Micronutrient deficiency, or also known as the hidden hunger, affects more than twice as many people while globally, approximately 672 million adults are obese. It has been estimated that 50% also of undernutrition is associated with infectious uh, infections caused by unsafe water, poor sanitation, and unhygienic practices. Repeated diarrhea or intestinal infections can cause both acute and chronic undernutrition. Water and food are ex exceptionalities in that they hold a special place in society and they are considered rights, right to food and right to water. They have been viewed in isolation, and, but that is changing as also we heard from Dan. We now have three decades that fit into the 2030 sustainable agenda. The de decade of action on nutrition from 2016 to 2025, the decade of action on water, 2018 to 2028. And the third one was just launched this past weekend on World Environment Day on June 5th. And that is the decade for ecosystem restoration from 2021 to 2020, uh, 2030. This provides an opportune time for tripling down on actions and finding the synergies to co-design, co-advocate and co-invest in which we hope to uh, gather here in these three days of conference. We need to diversify agriculture and shift the diets to reduce demand on water through innovative technologies to enhance the efficiency of crop water use. We need to improve the food value chain from production, post-harvest, handling, processing, retailing, consumption to distribution and trade for efficient water and food recycling strategies that can be addressed. We need to increase the supply and demand of managed water through proper um, investment infrastructure and to create new institutional arrangements. In short, building back better must include a health in all practice or policies approach that remains grounded in equity and addresses the social, environmental, and also the economic determinants of health. We also must recognize the importance of infectious disease prevention and control including water security, sanitation hygiene, to fight against waterborne diseases, antimicrobial resistance on farm and off farm, which we work a lot uh, with our partner agencies, such as the WHO and also the OIE. And advancing our broader global health security and health system strengthening objectives. Every year, over 420,000 people die and about 600 million people that's about one in 10 fall ill after eating contaminated food. That cost, that cost is about 95 billion US dollars per year lost in productivity and also foodborne illnesses in low and middle income countries. Related to water scarcity where drought, flood, storms and sea level rise have increased, approximately three quarters of the key global stable crop of maize, rice, soy, and wheat have experienced drought-induced yield losses with estimated cumulative production losses of 166 billion US dollars. So sustainable management utilization of natural resources for the benefit of the present and future generations is needed from water to soils and land to preserve our ecosystem services and prevent biodiversity loss. The use of natural resources by agriculture should contribute to sustainable production for more nutritious food options, providing a healthy and balanced diet to people. The nexus this conference intends to explore between water, food, nutrition, and health, this includes human and animals and environmental health, is at the crux of international engagement and action uh, to strengthen knowledge and capacity to safeguard and coordinate on our natural capital. 
We should also maintain a strong focus on gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls to achieve the goals of the UN Agenda 2030 and Sustainable Development Goals 2 and 6, as well as many others, as their important role as agents of change and leaders in our societies are all in these sectors. At FAO, we welcome and encourage the work of all of our partners. We recognize the need to ensure complementarity, to work together in close collaboration and coordination, also with other international initiatives. Um, to define and develop a shared understanding towards building a better, resilient future. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. And now we will hear from another uh, co-chair of the International Scientific Committee, Yuan Wen Li, who is Vice President of IWRA and Professor at the General Institute of Water Resources and Hydropower Planning and Design at the Ministry of Water Resources of China. Yuan Yuan? Yeah, good, good evening from Beijing. Thank you, Rene. Uh, I ho hope everybody is fine. And uh, it's really been a pleasure to uh, on this online conference and uh, working with our colleagues to share some of the thinking of the water uh, knowledge with uh, international colleagues. We all know water is very important because it's linked and interacted to almost everything in the world. It's uh, the precondition of human existing and also it's uh, essential for the ecological systems. And also water is also very important for food security and uh, human health, social economic development, health, urban industry development and everything. So water is linked to everything. And uh, we are also living in a changing world because of the climate change, land use change, environmental change. So water actually have more and more strong interlinkage between all other factors and with other uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, related uh, efforts. Actually, uh, particularly this year, the pandemic actually hit us and uh, is also bring us to think about the, the, the situations under the emerging situation, how we ensure our water security uh, issues. So that's really a very important issue for, for us. And so that's why we put uh, this conference as together water, food and health. Because as <coughs> so sorry, as in China, agriculture is takes about the seven sixty uh, seven percent of total water use, and with this seventy sixty seven percent of water withdrawals, we produced about uh, seventy to eighty percent of our green productions. So that's how we can see how important of this water to food security is. But in many cases, not only in China, but also in the world, we have, we have saw uh, many phenomena. Some place, the water, land, uh, and uh, food production, actually they are not coordinated, they are not matched well uh, together. Like in some place, we actually produce more food production by use, overuse, groundwater resources, overuse the surface water resources. It has caused the uh, degradation of the ecological systems. Uh, so there is a really a need how to coordinate the water, land, agriculture, and the food production policies. And also from the water use and the water withdrawal, uh, water discharge aspects, with our use of the water resources, we will discharge the waste waters. With the waste water, if you are not uh, properly treated, so we got the uh, effluent, effluent, get the pollutions, it will uh, definitely cause uh, degradation of the water qualities. It will also bring the water quality and health issues. So water use, uh, water discharge, 
and water quality, they are also interlinked. They are also the nexus. They are not also interactivity, uh, interactively uh, working together. So that's we have to be thinking about you know integrated ways uh, to have the coordinated uh, policies among different uh, uh, steps of the water management withdrawal, uh, water use, water saving, uh, water consumption, water discharge, and also the uh, disaster, all the aspects. So that's where we require efforts, not only the academics, not uh, only the scientists. We needed to study the rules. We needed to study the mechanism of these interactions we needed to study the 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 the, the interlinkage, the technical interlinkage between different factors related to water, but also we need the, the policy makers, the different sector peoples, land peoples, water peoples, food peoples, health peoples, environmental peoples, sitting together and coordinated with their policies, and also we needed. The, the the in the in the field in the, in the practice uh, the 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 different sector of people the different uh, background uh, of the people they are working together to achieve the water security food security health security and also the environmental securities so that's all some of our ex expectation from the co-chairs and we hope to put this water, food, uh, health, next access together. And also we wish to bring the scientific, sci sci scientists, uh, technicians, and also the uh, policy makers and management peoples together to have some inter uh, uh, discussions to developing a sustainable development and management of water resources. I do hope everybody will enjoy this conference and uh, makes a great contribution to the, uh, to the conference and also to make a great contribution to the better management of our water resources for our world, for our people, for our future. Thank you, Renan. Thank you, Juan Juan. Um, and uh, now we're going to hear from our third ISC co-chair, Robbie Motar, who is Dean of the Faculty of Agricultural and Life Sciences at the American University of Beirut and President of Environmental Resources Engineering at Texas A&M University. He's also chair of uh, one of our committees at IWRA. Robbie? Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, Renee, and thank you all uh, for tuning in. Uh, looking forward for the next three days to learn and exchange uh, some uh, policy, some science uh, answers to this complex problem that uh, my colleagues have mentioned earlier. Uh, I'd like to stop at the uh, reflecting on the duration for the preparation for this conference. The, the key word that continuously came across in all of our discussion was system. So water is a catalyst for human security, uh, a lifeline from food, hygiene, human ecosystem, health, as has been indicated by my colleagues earlier. Uh, the current water challenge, as has been highlighted by uh, many of the earlier speakers, is complex and can only be addressed at this system level. So I would like to highlight the system because what we're looking at here is a system, is a complex system of systems that include all of the elements that were mentioned earlier. Uh, the current water management practices is based on water allocation. So every sector gets certain allocation uh, of the sectors of the uh, economy. Uh, agriculture, as been highlighted earlier, uh, has the highest proportion of this allocation. This practice has created, of course, competition among the various water stakeholders. So what we're hoping today is to really understand this synergy between water, food, and health because they're really uh, sectors that potentially could be competing and look at synergies among these sectors, understanding the science, understanding the policy, understanding the practices. As earlier was highlighted by my colleague, uh, Dr. Kooshima, she's talking about the projections of the uh, freshwater for the uh, future. And there is a diminishing 
fresh water, sur fresh uh, surface and subsurface water available for food production. Many reasons for that. Climate, with climate change, 10 to 30 percent uh, less precipitation, particularly in the subtropical region. And of course, uh, my colleague Yunyan mentioned the land use changes. There's a, uh, another competing, uh, not only for water, but a competing resource, which is land. Uh, so uh, land for people, land for agriculture. This is also because of that demographic shift. Uh, would actually, uh, uh, that shift is projected as uh, earlier uh, highlighted, 50% increase in food production, while malnutrition is at rise in many parts of the world. So if you put all of these pieces together, we have 40% global water gap that's being projected. And this cannot be solved with an old business model. We need a new business model that governs the relationship between water, food, and health. So let me talk a little bit about this uh, new business model, which has to be based on values, values of water, land, and energy, and human ecosystem and health. We need to look at how can we, we understand these complexities, these interactions, and reduce the interdependencies so that the system can be more resilient, as has been mentioned earlier. So we need to reassess the relationship between water and food. Again, this requires multiple talents, as been uh, indicated earlier. It requires a transformation of how we produce and consume uh, food, land, water, other resources, keeping circularity in mind. This also goes for an alternative, safe, low-cost water sources, including green and wastewater. Uh, let me also highlight that uh, let's not forget that water is responsible for transport processes in the water and food system, giving rise to more recent water and food safety concerns globally. Because of the pandemic, we probably have forgot about the major uh, uh, issues that uh, uh, water is a catalyst for that, and we need to be looking at the safety of our food system. And I think the FAO has two uh, sessions in the coming uh, three days highlighting some of this. So I'd like to pose some questions in the water food system that I hope this conference will contribute to. The first is how to produce more for less, and this specifically would, would uh, maybe targeting to uh, food production. Again, as uh, Dr. Koshima mentioned, it's not only the food, uh, we're looking at nutrition security as well. The second question is how do we create synergy among these sectors? Uh, these sectors are potentially competing and we need to look at synergy that can uh, be identified among them. Uh, how can we promote circularity in these systems? This is not an easy uh, process. Academically, may, we may be sitting down and identify the entry points, but in practice, it's a very complicated issue because a lot of our system has its own uh, 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 programs in place to allow us to, uh, to, 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 to produce food. And the food system is extremely uh, uh, complex in terms of circularity because the profit margin for this system is very, very low. Uh, so we don't have a lot of margin to work with. The fourth question is how do we transform the food system to integrate nutritional value of food, values of water input and air, soil, water pollution into the production business model? So again, going back to a, an evolving need for developing a new sustainable business model for food production. Uh, the fifth question that I hope this conference will also address is how do we increase the resilience of the food system to future pandemics? Uh, several of the speakers earlier mentioned that, but I think we have lessons to learn, to reflect on, to make our food system uh, more resilient to these shocks that we have experienced over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, the last question that I'd like uh, this conference, I hope this conference will, will, uh, will also uh, educate us is how to, how to how, what are the platforms that are missing to foster multidisciplinarity in the water food health system. Uh, the speakers earlier mentioned this uh, complex players and complex talent that need to come together to work. So do we have the right platforms that allow this dynamic to happen? So uh, in closing, and on behalf of the co-chair, I invite you all uh, to contribute to the planned special issue in Water International that will be published through the regular peer review process that published the state of the art and science in the Nexus of the water, food, health nexus. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I look forward to uh, a, a, a great uh, conference that we all learn uh, from each other. Thank you. Back to you, Rene. Thank you, Robbie. Um, and I neglected to mention that Yuan Yuan Li is also a very active um, uh, 
member of IWRA. So we are blessed to have both Robbie and Yuan Wan on the ISC for this conference. Thanks to both of you for your efforts. Um, I would now like to introduce um, Dr. James W. Jones, who goes by Jim. He is a distinguished professor emeritus of the University of Florida. And the title of his keynote speech is going to be Understanding and Guiding Complex Systems to Achieve Multiple Societal Goals. Jim? Thank you, Renee. And uh, I really appreciate the introduction. And I would have to say to start with, wow, what an exciting conference. I congratulate you on choosing this topic. It's a very broad one, very difficult as, as the speakers have already pointed out. And, uh, but you've been mentioning some of the same things that we've been spending a lot of time here on in the US and trying to address these same kinds of issues and, and, and problems. Um, my uh, presentation is uh, very broadly going to address the importance of using systems approaches and how we're doing that uh, here in the US with an, uh, a new initiative that we're starting, as well as one that we've, um, we've worked on in the past. Uh, but anyway, these are very complex systems. And so what I'm going to do here is, is to discuss some of these major societal goals that have already been alluded to as uh, inferring the need for complex systems. Uh, and, and that includes water, food, and one health, but it also includes uh, water, food, and energy, which is one of the things that I'll talk about more. And also emphasize the importance of using convergent systems approaches and, and give an example of how we're going about that here in the US. I mean, I, the speakers so far have have emphasized each one of them, the complexities and, and complications of actually making progress on this and the fact that the sustainable development goals have been not, not achieved as rapidly as one would desire. These are complex issues. So I'll talk about that and in in, in go through just very briefly in the time that I have a couple of these uh, initiatives that, that I've been involved in helping to develop and leading here uh, in the US. The thing I wanna point out first of all is to remind you, I mean, many of you probably know this, but uh, complex systems are really different from complicated ones. You can design a complicated system in engineering or you know, watch or a, a hydrology system or uh, things like that, and, and they will perform as you determined, as, you, uh, as desired. Complex systems though have emergent behaviors some of which may be unintended and unwanted, but this, uh, this emergency of, the emergence of the different behaviors is due to the complexities. And in many cases that we're dealing with in society, it's because of all the decision makers and the policies and the variations that are associated with, uh, with uh, different actors in the system. Um, and examples of these uh, complex systems are ecosystems, economies, worldwide web, spread of viral infections, and I think One Health fits in that same category. And one of the things that I've worked on uh, when I was at National Science Foundation for three and a half years was leading the uh, Food Energy Water Nexus uh, initiative along with Tom Torgerson, who's a, who's a hydrology engineer. These, uh, there are many grand challenges today, uh, such as some that have been defined by the National Academies of Engineering uh, and, and different societal goals that really will require these systems approaches and, and nexus uh, perspectives on, on really understanding and being able to guide these systems. We can't really dictate exactly how they're going to come out, but at least guide them in the performance that we desire in society. And I'll just uh, throw this up there because this is one of the really complex ones that's already been mentioned. And I, I think you can pull any of these uh, sustainable development goals out and look at the interconnections that it has with many others. And so you can, you can um, think about each one of these as having nexus kinds of of interactions that need to be taken into account to really accomplish something in our uh, complex society. So this is one of the uh, efforts I wanted to talk about, the uh, Infuse initiative. 
uh, innovations at the nexus of food, energy, and water systems. Uh, the National Science Foundation and USDA uh, developed this initiative in the U.S. and uh, funded oh, around 100 or more uh, projects through that initiative on uh, systems approaches for addressing the nexus of food, energy, and water systems. And this, the, the importance of this has already been pointed out by some of the speakers before. The increase in population, demand for food is increasing, water demand is increasing. Current systems are not going to uh, adequately address these needs of the future, as, as we all know, for food, energy, and water. And I don't want to go through very many. I just don't have time for that. But I wanted to point out this slide to, that, that highlights one of the projects that was funded by uh, uh, Kelly Babbitt at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. And the emphasis here is that there are different ways of looking at food, energy, and water systems. As a food, uh, food scientist or food engineer, I might look at it from a perspective of the food, but then looking at all of the other things that, that happen in it. And that's what uh, Callie Babbitt did in this, uh, in this project, managing energy, water, and information flows for sustainability across the advanced food ecosystem. The state of New York was her uh, uh, laboratory for this. Uh, they had partners all over the state that would, from where they would uh, collect uh, food waste. So the real emphasis was on food waste and how to use that and not waste it and also pollute the environment. Things like life cycle assessments, uh, models are very useful in organizing these things and then diagrams that represent one's thinking about how these systems might be in the future to compare with the way they are currently. It was an important part of all of these different projects that we funded. We required each proposal to have a context statement where they define their system and what the boundaries were. And then the goals of, of those uh, systems could be focusing more on water or more on food or more on energy, but they typically address other things as well. And this is a slide I got from uh, Seeming Kai at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He circled food, energy, and water there as the main focus of food, energy, water systems. But many of our proposals that came in were also emphasizing climate change or policy uh, changes that might be needed to enable the kind of food, energy, and water systems that we, we see are, are needed and, and economics of these, of these different systems. So one's perspective uh, helps to create the, uh, the system diagram, the system's boundaries, and so forth. But regardless of that, it was essential, and we require this in our effort to have food, energy, and water discipline specialists involved in order to really understand what these interactions were, de depending on what the goals of the individual projects were. Uh, I'd say that was a very successful uh, initiative. We actually had a, a joint effort with uh, China on uh, food, energy, and water as well, and uh, just and and the, these kind of projects are still continuing. I want to turn now mostly to some of the things that we're working on now, and this is on food and agricultural systems. and And uh, circularity has already been mentioned, but this is one thing that we're doing here. We we focused on the need for changes in the food chain, uh, for because of all the water and energy and environmental and biodiversity, human health outcomes and economic considerations that take place as the provision of food uh, is, is, uh, is, is produced from, from uh, the field to the fork, so to speak, and beyond in terms of the waste. These are complex systems. Uh, many actors along the food chain, even before it gets to scaling up, using economics or other things are, uh, are different. And so decisions may be different and, and the outcomes are, could have 
you know, respond to shocks and weather extremes, pandemics like last year. We had a wake up call last year. Of course, all of us did with the, the pandemic. So these are complex systems. Uh, uh, National Academies has, has been weighing in on this in the US and, and looking at ways that, that can be done. And they've uniformly, these different studies over the last five or 10 years have, have emphasized the importance of systems approaches and uh, convergence of disciplines, transdisciplinary uh, convergence of and having everyone involved from the start to really understand these systems. Uh, one of the things that we looked at was, you know, taking a look at the food chains right now, we recognized the thing that uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation has published on quite a bit, that our current food systems are mostly linear. We have inputs going in on one side, production, processing, transportation, uh, consumption, and then waste going out the other or losses along the way. So they're mostly linear and, and transformations are essential in order to get the supply side of our food products to be more, more sustainable. So a circular economy, it sounds like uh, most of you may already be familiar with these. Uh, it's inspired by nature and the, and the fact that nature, in nature waste doesn't uh, occur. One organism's waste is food for another. And what we've done in our, uh, in our look at food systems is, is take a look at these principles that Ellen MacArthur uh, and, and their studies have identified to design out waste and pollution, keep products and materials in use, and regenerate natural systems. And if you apply these same principles across the whole food chain, from inputs to production, processing, and so forth, then an output of, of an outcome of those uh, of applying these is a more sustainable system. So sustainability of food systems uh, is an outcome of considering the circularity and including all of the nexus issues that, that have been spoken of earlier. The uh, left side of this diagram, the diagram itself shows the linear depiction and the right side shows the aspirational goal of making everything truly circular. We know that can't be done uh, 100%, but to the extent that we can improve the circularity, then we will be improving sustainability. Uh, and the American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineering and, and a, a, an international society for biosystems engineers, we've had a study of, a five, of six different systems looking at these principles and seeing how that might work. Uh, and we've got, we've got these published. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but we've got these uh, published in a, um, some papers that, we, that I'll refer to later on. But they all are saying the same things that, you, that you've been saying. We need to envision solutions that potentially achieve circularity and sustainability and resiliency and, and, and also, of, of course, uh, health outcomes. Uh, one of the things that has to be done, and this was shown even in the uh, New York study, that uh, life cycle assessments are really important. Keep up with the, uh, the uh, embedded, the virtual energy, the virtual water, the virtual, I mean, the carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus transport throughout these cycles. And, and there could also be some other ones like uh, food nutri uh, the nutritional uh, characteristics of food that are produced and the safety uh, indicators for it. So all of these, so what, what this tells us is that we're going to have to have more information about the provision of food than we've had in the past and that documents these different uh, flows and, and losses so that the, the decisions can be made more holistically about the implications of, of choosing uh, supply chains that are have one characteristic uh, versus another. This is one of the things that we published in there, just looking at uh, some of the main production systems in the US, like this is corn soybean in the Midwest. Uh, Bruno Basso at Michigan State, myself and others uh, worked on this, looking at ways to start making changes now in the near term using technologies that are available. And then looking for technologies that are in the pipeline 
that can can contribute to these uh, new systems uh, in the in the midterm. And then by 2035 to 2050, uh, and, and identify new technologies and new businesses and new policies that are needed in order to uh, make these things more sustainable and more resilient. This uh, image on this slide shows the uh, the publication that that explains what we did in those in those studies. Uh, it's the March April issue in 2021 of the Resource Journal from ASABE, and you can find that online. And I would encourage you to look at that because that that was a serious look at some of the challenging problems we have in beef systems and and uh, pork systems and corn soybean and tomatoes and and the greenhouse systems. Uh, but we also found out in those studies that that we need we need to do more. This is just a start. It's interesting now that the National Academies are really uh, uh, recommending initiatives like this. The National Science Foundation is funding initiatives like this. The U.S. Department of Energy, uh, of Energy, U.S. Department of Agriculture are providing opportunities and requiring some more of these systems approaches than we had in the past. The National Academy of Engineering is also going to be highlighting this in some of their programming, and they and they've never really done this before. They haven't really dealt with with uh, food systems, for example, until until now. So I, I'll stop there with with questions, really. But I think that these uh, the the topic of this conference is uh, exactly what it should be: dealing with uh, human animal and environmental health, uh, dealing with food and water. My guess is you'll probably also include energy and in, by necessity in, in many of these studies that are done and address climate change. But we need better systems approaches uh, that, are, that are informed by interdisciplinary teams who are, who are experts in their own field who, and who might envision these systems being different to start with, but by working together, we can come up with the uh, convergent system. So I'm happy to say that there's strong interest in multiple disciplines uh, now. Uh, through the ASABE, we're connecting with, uh, I don't know, 10 or so other professional societies in agronomy, economics, engineering, policy, to, to, to explore what we can do together to increase the emphasis across our disciplines and between disciplines on uh, achieving these multiple societal goals like uh, uh, sustainable uh, food systems. So let me stop there. And if there's time for questions, I'll be happy to take them. Or if you have questions and want more in information later on, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim, for this very intriguing presentation, um, which raised a few questions in my mind. But we do have time for Q&A. And um, okay. I'm going to ask my co-moderator, Mary Trudeau, um, if she has some questions from the audience. And uh, we'll take those first. Sure. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation, Jim. It was uh, really interesting. And we do have two questions specifically for you. There, there are couple of other questions that we can direct to the panel um, later on. So one of the questions is about how much water is used in um, directly producing uh, food as opposed to processing. Um, and so maybe more broadly, do we know, uh, are we sure we know the priorities for uh, where water is used within that, uh, that current linear chain that you, uh, you spoke about? Well, it really depends on the system that you're, you're <clears throat> that one is interested in. I don't have an aggregate figure there that says, okay, all processing requires this much, all production. I know an, an awful lot of it is in production of systems through irrigation uh, and so forth, but there is a lot of, of water that is being used in, in processing of different, different things. And, and one thing I didn't mention too, <clears throat> Some, some of these uh, uh, disruptive technologies like uh, cellular meat, you know, they, these are being looked at as well, as well as some of the vertical farming 
uh, techniques now specifically to reduce the water requirements. Some of these now are requiring a lot of energy still. And so we have to look at the, uh, the nexus issues there as well. But I don't really have any figures. I know that in the US it's somewhere over 50% of the water is used in, in, uh, in, in agriculture. So that's probably more on the production side. If, if I can say one, one more thing, I mean, one of the things that we're looking at is ways to partner with different groups. And to the extent that there may be some uh, interest in IWRA and others in partnering with this coalition that we're building here, and not just in the US, but internationally, I think, with what we're doing, we would certainly be interested in learning more about that. And of course, Robbie, uh, Motar is is very familiar with the, the things that we're doing, but I would also be happy to uh, interact with you on that as well. Um, we also had a question about um, the forty percent of food not being consumed, and whether that's within a specific country or um, where that statistic arises. Well, I think that's uh, from my studies on this. It, it seems like that's more in developed countries as opposed to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, or developing countries where a lot of the practices that are used there uh, are, are more, perhaps not quite as efficient on farms. And so a lot more of the uh, waste or losses are occurring in the farm through pest damage and, and uh, spoilage and, and things like that. But but in the U.S., it's, it's uh, in the range of 40 to 50 percent of, of uh, food waste. We can't really close the cycle completely like in circularity goals are. But if we can capture these, like the, like the, the project in, in New York is doing, is capturing these from the large facilities and even from, from uh, consumers. There's a project in Illinois now uh, that... Uh, is collecting, has devices that they can collect food waste from, from homeowners. But this can, this can possibly be some of the answers that we're looking for, but we need a way to uh, reconnect that, those resources that are not consumed back to productive use in different ways. And that's what, that's what we're looking at. Okay. Um, so maybe a question for, uh, for the panelists that came in before the keynote um, question, and it's about pragmatic measures uh, that the global community is taking um, to conserve water level or water availability, and um, if there are sanctions of some kind for, for violations of that. So maybe the broad, broad question of protecting water availability um, amongst these competing needs. And so maybe Jim, we can start with you and then open it to the panel. Well, I can give some examples of that uh, just here in Florida, for example. I mean, there have been a lot of uh, environmental issues here. We have a lot of water here, but we also have a lot of people and competing uses just like anywhere else. And um, some of the water that we were using to produce uh, dairy uh, products in, in Central Florida was going into uh, one of our main lakes, Lake Okeechobee, and polluting it. And so the state of Florida bought those dairies out. They required them to stop doing that. Uh, many of them started using better uh, best management practices, and but many of them actually moved to a different part of the of the country. Uh, so there's there's those kind of things in terms of of uh, consequences of bad outcomes from agriculture. But there's also a lot of effort here in the US uh, by companies that are looking for ways to increase the efficiency of resource uses, including water and energy. And, um, and so, I th and, and there's also look now at changing policies. I think policies is a, is a big issue. Someone mentioned that earlier, but policies that would be more, uh, more sensitive to the societal needs that we have and, and have uh, incentives or perhaps penalties for uh, bad, bad behavior that would waste water or contaminate lakes or, or water bodies or 
emit greenhouse gases. So that's being discussed seriously now. I don't know how that will come out here in the U.S. It's, it's, uh, as policies go, it's very political these days. But, but this, this is being discussed, and, and I hope that, that over time we'll be able to achieve these kind of changes in policies as well as new technologies that together uh, across the different sectors, food, energy, water, health, we, can, uh, we, will, we will come up with better solutions. It's just the circular systems that I've been talking about provide a way to help guide what, those, what the thinking is and what uh, actions uh, should be taken. Oh, Mary, thank you so thank much, Jim and Mary. Um, I think we're going to move on to our next speaker now. Um, Jim, I had a question you. for you. When, when you're trying to move a complex system, where do you start? I know that there's no silver bullet, but and I love your your idea of collaboration among you know different groups and different disciplines. IWRA bridges science and policy, but you know where do you start? Um, and I guess well, that's um, finding the stakeholders and gathering them together. Uh, yes, that, but also trying to identify the. The, the losses and the leakages from the system. That's one of the first things you do. You, we've got existing systems. So if you look across that, each particular system, like a uh, beef production system or a tomato production system, there are losses that occur and waste that happen. And you identify those and then you say, okay, what, what would be needed in terms of technology or policies are businesses that would help alleviate those losses and, and change them into things. So that, that list that I didn't really go through there has some of the uh, steps that we, we went, are going through. And uh, by the way, just finally on that, we have a, a July the 12th, we have a, an interdisciplinary Congress in, uh, in the US that will have these different disciplines coming together, uh, working together. And I hope Robbie will be there and, and many of you as well. Uh, but we need those kind of things where we have industries at the table, we have different disciplines, and we go through these exercises uh, for the different kinds of systems that we have in terms of supply chain. Now, bringing in the economics and policy, that is sort of, okay, you've got the supply chain, uh, you've done as much as you can with it. Now let's look at how this scales up, what policies are needed to scale it up. And so we've got economists now that are beginning to look at that. And of course, uh, organizations like IFPRI with their economic model, they're already doing that some with water. They've incorporated a hydrology model in with their economic model now to look at different indicators of and outcomes for different policies and, and actions. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those insights. Um, all right, now, sure. um, we are going to move on, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Aziza Akmush, who is head of division, cities, urban policies, and sustainable development at OECD. Aziza? Thank you very much, Renee, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. My pleasure to be with you today, and a big thanks to the IWRA team. Uh, not only for the excellent organization uh, of the Congress, but also for selecting a topic that, as many of the previous speakers emphasized, is both timely and relevant uh, in, in the context of this COVID-19 pandemic in the sense that, as we've seen for many other public policies from across the globe, uh, it has really acted, this COVID-19 pandemic, as a trend accelerator, as a magnifying glass, putting really on the spotlight long-standing pressing issues and uh, radical needs for transformation to transition to a low carbon economy and making today's, you know, um, paradigm shifts potentially slightly more acceptable socially and politically than they were just a year ago. And, and I think it's time to resume these conversations that for many of us in the water community were having for over a decade, but that probably have a window today uh, that are likely to support their implementation. And the main message I would like to convey to all of you today uh, from the work we've been doing over a decade and a half um, at the OECD is that to some extent, when we are looking at the mega trends 
challenges that many governments have to face today from climate to urbanization to globalization all the way through digitalization cities the local scale the functional uh, approach based on where people actually work and live appears more and more at least in the oecd and emerging economies as the the scale at which such radical transformation is likely to happen maybe faster and uh, and and i'd like to give you a, a very briefly some um, flavor of how the urban community today is to some extent uh, borrowing a lot of the lessons uh, that the water community has uh, uh, shaped over the past decade. The first one is about the relationship to sustainable development. And many of us in the water community re remember the extent to which we had to fight strong and hard to raise the profile of water, not only as a sectoral issue and challenge, but as a driver to sustainable development and making sure that actually a dedicated, and I'm saying dedicated rather than standalone uh, sustainable development goal number six, be devoted to that. Because considering that it was everywhere, it was somehow nowhere also at the time. And, and it was very clear uh, with the dedicated goal on sustainable cities and communities that a similar approach was actually followed, making sure that at that scale, some of the radical transformations needed for a more prosperous uh, uh, sustainability, uh, environmental sustainable planet, etc., were happening. And that's, uh, I would say, this cross-sectoral nature that feeds into the systemic approach that some of you have emphasized, um, a very important issue in uh, many of the decision makers today. The second point is uh, related to the uh, combinations that you are making between health, food, and water, which we also see uh, in many city governments happening um, to drive, let's say, this multidisciplinary or cross-sectoral coordination that makes sure that progress that is made in one of these specific areas does not necessarily work against progress that is um, uh, needed in other policy sectors. And this pandemic has shown to some extent that even if cities and local governments do not necessarily uh, master uh, the complexity of the health conversation, which in many OECD countries remains largely centralized, they are ultimately the main drivers for what we call the social, environmental, and, and let's say economic determinants of health, because this is at that scale that a large chunk of the public investment that um, helps improve air pollution, urban mobility, and other uh, externalities that are linked to the agglomerations are discharged, not only to ensure the environmental sustainability, but also uh, to revisit the way we plan uh, locally for economic development development, the way we invest, the way we allocate budget, and this conversation around the scale at which the policy synergies and complementarities can be made and the sectors through which that policy complementarity can be achieved is also extremely timely for many OECD um, governments today. And that takes me to the third and last point, which is some of the paradigm shifts that we have observed for the cities of tomorrow that I think the water community has long been looking looking at. And there are three of them. The first one is the call for more nature in cities in the same way we've been advocating for more nature-based solutions to address some of the pressing risks related to water uh, security. The second one is the search for more local production, local consumption, local um, accessibility to different amenities. And we've seen how the water community has been pioneering this transition also in the circular economy field where water is scarce. We know that every drop actually counts and many of the circular solutions are today aiming at reusing water and using it more efficiently, doing more with less and, and creating energy and other uh, new material. And the third and last point is really how we can mainstream a sustainable development lens in the local policy making. We've seen how many cities from across the globe today are using the SDGs not only as a top-down or not necessarily as a top-down agenda from the UN that local governments have to make happen because ultimately those that are accountable are national governments, but as a policy tool to manage the trade-offs and competing demands. And I'll conclude with that because the water community has long acknowledged that 
actually um, the 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 main challenge that governments face is not so much the what to do or even how to pay for it, but it's basically how we articulate the who does what at which scale. And this is about governance and mastering complexity. So I just wanted to conclude on this positive note because I, I feel sometimes and having spent over a decade working on water that um, we are uh, insat insatisfied in terms of the, the magnitude of the challenge, but it's very nice to see the extent to which some of the lessons from that uh, community have have been really uh, borrowed and used for other urban policy sectors and especially to manage the complexity of such problems at scale. Thank you, Aziza. Um, and now our final speaker is uh, Loïc Fauchon, who is president of the World Water Council. Loïc? Uh, dear friends, uh, dear friends of water, very pleased to be with you this, uh, this afternoon. Um, let me pay uh, Special greetings to the governors of the World Water Council uh, who talked before me, uh, uh, Sasha, uh, uh, Yuan Wan, uh, uh, Rabi, uh, and Kalum also. Um, I'm very, really, really pleased to be with you uh, uh, this afternoon. Why? Uh, because after so many years of continuous advocacy for the horizontal uh, approach, uh, we are, and I am especially more than delighted to see that you, uh, experts in food health and water resource management, um, have decided to, to join uh, your forces and put your knowledge in common to, to consider water, food, and health as one and a joint uh, challenge. Uh, an interlinked challenge with uh, energy and education. As mentioned in the title of the conference, we are in a changing world, not only due to climate uncertainty, but also, and mainly uh, as uh, Sasha insists, due to population growth and development uh, inequity. We are living in a world of crisis and we are practicing uh, emergency management on a daily basis at every scale from uh, global to, to local. Our main common objective is to achieve water, uh, water security everywhere and for all. Water security remains more than ever the challenge of this uh, 21st century. Securing water resources on the scale of a continent uh, mean to be able to secure food and health also. Uh, and uh, for now, for today, but also for tomorrow. And that's uh, uh, an essential uh, priority and planetary uh, target. And uh, we all know that water security uh, is a daily obligation, a daily imperative, a constant reality, a, a need for all and a right for all a right for all. Our mission, the mission of the World Water Council is to make water a political priority because water is politics. We need to work on a more precise definition of water security and we are working on the detection of good practices and recommendations to progress, responses to present, uh, to present during the next forum. Because despite uh, of our uh, constant efforts, the demand uh, for water is growing faster than the supply. Uh, one of the previous uh, speakers talks about 30% of growing uh, water need during the next uh, 30 years. But water security means supplying more good quality, uh, quality water, and at the same time, consuming less and in a better way. Generating more resources by pumping deeper when necessary, storing water, which will be one of the major problems of the next decade, because in so many countries at the moment, we are not able to store water. We will have also to interconnect dams uh, transferring water over long distances as that has been made in China, uh, improving treatment and supply 
is not sufficient. At the same time, it's essential to control water use and save water. We need to manage our resource correctly, better, to use modern leak detection techniques, put an end to the enormous waste in agriculture in particular, and desalinate seawater or reuse wastewater. Reuse water and wastewater will be the next revolution in the field of water. And we have all to work uh, together, mostly in agriculture. It's a question of mo moving towards sharing resources while, uh, while avoiding waste and, ed and educating the younger generation on the importance of uh, saving resources. On the one hand, we need to rely on technology, especially digital technology, to implement uh, all the solutions we are familiar with. And on the other hand, uh, show how to reduce collective and individual waste through a change in policy approach. Why is water security a key concept to our comprehensive approach? Because to ensure water for the basic needs for human and nature, two main basic needs are food and health, of course. And it's the subject of this conference. Food self-sufficiency is going to be one of the greatest questions of this century as it has been said by all the speakers. And the COVID-19 crisis has shown us the importance of water, of hand washing, and that a pandemic can throw the world into poverty. But let me open up the perspective. There are two other human needs strongly interconnected with water and indispensable for development. I mean energy and education. Water and energy because we need water to produce clean energy and energy to produce water. Both worlds are still working separately, unfortunately. And education because it's our duty for the future generations. And we should not forget nature, which is the prospective, the protective surrounding of our future and the guarantee of a balanced uh, development. Water, energy, food, health, and education are the five basic needs of mankind, and they cannot be separated like the five fingers of a hand. They form of the five fingers alliance concept, and nature is the palm of this hand. What is the practical significance of such an alliance? In practice, it invites us to build development policies that take these five aspects into account without leaving one or more of them by the wayside. For example, what would be the point of building a school in a shanty town if its pupils and teachers do not have enough to heat wash or care for themselves. Similarly, how could an hospital be built in a remote rural area of Africa or Asia without access to proper water and electricity? As we can see, uh, each of the five fundamental rights commands the others and vice versa. And in order to organize equitable, equitable access to water on a global scale, especially specialists in the five fundamental rights will have to work together. As the World Water Council does it, and how you have started to do it today, and for this, you deserve our congratulations. In particular, the link between water and renewable energy will need to be more strongly established and development policies designed accordingly. We are on the road to the ninth World Water Forum. I was yesterday in Dakar, and we are preparing this uh, forum in March 2022, co-organized by the World Water Council and the state of Senegal and the city of Dakar. I invite all of you 
uh, to seize this opportunity to continue to work together and bring concrete responses to implement the right to water, to the essential services, and to dignity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Loic, for that perspective. Um, and uh, we have a couple of minutes now for uh, questions. Uh, Mary, um, is there a question that we can take from the audience? Yeah, there's been a lot of interest um, and some, some chat discussion on waste. So food waste, um, water waste. And I, I, I guess it makes sense if if this, if we're going to establish priorities, one of the priorities would be to try to reduce waste. Um, so maybe the panelists, starting with uh, Rabbi, if you have comments um, that you'd like to make on on waste reducing waste within the food chain. Th thank you, Mary. Yes, indeed. Uh, but we need to distinguish between waste in developed and waste in developed countries and developing countries. Uh, one can be solved with technology and one has to be solved with transformation of our behavior. I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, our research has actually in study indicated that roughly about 40%, I mean, you could uh, plus or minus 40% uh, of the food we produce is lost. In developing countries, that is lost in the processing, in the harvesting, in the transportation because of cold storage. So that is an easy solution if we have technology, that can be a technological solution that improve on the food, food losses, not food waste, but food losses. In many of the developed countries, that is a food waste because uh, that is lost after uh, being purchased and a lot of it in restaurant and in household. Uh, in a simple study that EPA did a few years ago, if you go and reduce the plate size, if you just re reduce the plate size, there is a significant reduction on food waste. We tend to eat less in, in, uh, if, if we reduce the, the, the plate size. That simple behavioral change uh, is very, very important. Uh, the, the, my interest personally from a nexus perspective on food waste and food loss is in fact, food loss is a water loss, it's an energy loss, it's a land loss, it's a loss of uh, 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 increase in carbon emission. So it goes back to the system we discussed earlier. So it's a very important aspect to address as a priority for many of the issues that have been discussed earlier in terms of uh, increasing uh, the improving the relationship between water and food, reducing the carbon emission and, and health and safety. So it's a, it's a tremendous uh, effort that needs to go into this. And I do believe with you, I agree with you, Mary, it should be a priority. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robbie. Uh, it's been a very full program and I'm afraid we have to stop now. Um, in closing, we have a few reminders for you. Uh, this ceremony, along with all of the sessions of the conference is being recorded and we will make the recordings as well as the PowerPoint presentations available both on the IWRA website and on the conference website shortly after the conference ends. Although many questions will have been answered either verbally or in writing during the sessions, we will not be able to address all questions posed during the conference. However, we will attempt to collect written responses from presenters to any unanswered questions and will place those answers on the conference website. We also want to remind you that you can see an excellent selection of submitted conference posters online at the conference website under the posters menu. If you have any questions regarding the posters, you can send an email to online.conference at iwra.org and we will contact the poster authors to respond to your queries. We want to thank all of the speakers whose participation in this opening ceremony crystallized the issues facing the world with respect to the linkages between water and health. Thanks again to our sponsors and our partners, FAO, UNESCO IHP, the American University of Beirut, the China Water Resources Association and Texas A&M University. Thanks also to the staff of IWRA and to the ISC of the conference whose tireless efforts ensured the high quality and efficient organization of the program. Thank you very much to everyone and the opening ceremony is now closed. <laughs>